You guys feed the birds? Hi, I'm Phil. Welcome to Pretty Good Cooking. Pretty good. Tonight on the show, I'm going to teach you how to make beef bourguignon. It's French. It's a stew. You'll, if you are a cereal viewer of our episodes, and I mean that in the sense of you have viewed them multiple times and are not um, a, a whole grain breakfast option, you will know we did a campfire stew that was kind of like this. But that was more like regular stew, and this is a French classic. It's a little fancier. There's no potatoes. I wanted to make this dish for you because it's something I've made a few times and I actually really like to make. I feel like it is an exercise in decadence. You're basically layering like different kinds of very indulgent foods upon each other into a very nice stew. But it's also kind of idiot proof because even if you don't really do it that well, it's still going to taste pretty good. So on that note, let's get started cooking. Here I have a Dutch oven and I am heating it over fairly high heat. And I'm warm so I'm taking off my sweater. Thus exposing my nips. There's actually a couple of different kinds of booze in this. So if I'm going to dip into them, I got to make sure we got enough for the entree. This is cognac, VSOP. That stands for... Very special O petunia. I need about a half cup of that. All right, uh, here I have some bacon. This is just over a half pound of bacon. And this is sort of like the, well, it is the first thing you'll cook. It's one of the first layers of fat in this delicious food. And you need to cut these into little strips. These are called lardons, which is kind of like a baton of bacon. That's it, or lard, I guess. That's how they got lard on. So basically, we're gonna cook these in some butter. And that butter and bacon base will be what we cook a lot of other things in, like the beef. All right, let's hit that pot with some clarified butter. A little teaspoon. So this is just to kind of lubricate the bacon cooking. And right off the bat, you're already hit with that amazing butter smell. Very pleasant. Yeah, I, I've turned the heat down to medium because if they cook too quickly, they'll burn. You don't want that. While those are cooking, we'll start cutting our beef. A fine brandy. Over here I got a couple pieces of chuck shoulder. Or buy one, get one. And we're gonna cut them into stew cubes. Stews. And this uh, this stew is supposed to be fairly chunky, so we will cut them a little bit bigger than you might in other contexts. And I'm gonna leave the fat on. And the reason for this is that since we're slow cooking this for a while, the fat should render pretty well. And make for a nice, fatty, healthy French dish. You know, like, all of them. Big old chunks. Remember that just like men have interactions with swimming pools, the beef will shrink. That was kind of a forced one, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Moving the cubes over to a bowl so I can cut the other piece. All in all, it's going to be a little over three pounds of beef. One of the nice things about cutting giant pieces of beef for a stew is it takes less time. It's easier, in fact. Easier just like your mama. Got my beef here. I'm gonna salt and pepper it. You also have the option to flour it. But I don't really, I don't really feel like um, flouring the beef for stew ahead of time really makes too much of a difference flavor-wise. Like the idea behind it is that you're gonna toast that flour that was on the beef and it's gonna help thicken up the stew. But what we're gonna do instead is, uh, we're just gonna make like a roux at the end. I think it's gonna be a little bit cleaner that way. Either way is okay. You could just do it now. I think we'll get nice, nicer, uh, veggies this way because it'll be more of like a, a clean a clean cook. So just a couple more minutes on the bacon and we'll can start cooking beef. Here I have some carrots. You want about a pound of carrots. That's what seven carrots. I'm gonna peel all these. Peeling is optional but I think it, it's nice when you're putting you know more effort into a dish than just the standard put food in my gut method to go that little extra mile. You need to preheat your oven. Yeah, go pretty low here. Probably down to like 300 or so. Bacon's looking nice and crisp. Go ahead and pull that out and we will set it aside in this bowl. 
Now we're gonna turn the heat up, well, medium high, and we are gonna cook the beef in batches. Now this is not fun to do because you got very little surface area, but it really is better if you sear the beef in batches. Don't just throw it in the pot. You get way better searing, browning, etc. I really do think it's best to do it like a piece at a time, such as I'm doing now. I'll show you what they look like in a second. So the reason that you do it in a single layer at a time is you get far superior browning that way. You can see how that's like golden, some of the fats turning golden as well. You get way better results this way. So the actual beef, even though it's going to cook a long time, is going to taste a little bit better. Look at that, that's real nice. So I'm going to keep doing this, it'll probably be a few minutes. So here, here's me a few minutes later. Here's batch number one of brown beef, looking really nice. So we'll just slap it in our baking bowl and repeat this process with the remaining beef. Once you've pulled the beef, it's a good idea to let the pan come back up to, to a hotter temperature for better searing. So just give it a second before you go to the next batch. Here we are back at our vegetable stand, chopping off the ends of those carrots. You can compost these if you're one of those people. I'm not. And again, you want to cut these uh, pretty chunky. Much chunkier than I normally would. Uh, also, it's nice to cut on a bisect. So you get pieces that look kind of like that. Again, we're going for a stew with a fairly large mouthfeel. I don't really know like a better term than that, but it's gonna be big and chunky, like me. Next up, I've got two halves of one onion. I thought it would be fun to have multiple kinds of onions in this. This one's yellow, the other one's white, and we're just gonna thinly slice. There will also be pearl onions in this. So if you think about these ones, these are almost like the uh, the ones that we want to brown and cook down, almost to the point that they're not too noticeable in the stew. They uh, That kind of onion will give some, some thickness to the stew, some like heftiness, I would say. Whereas the pearl onions will be more recognizable as onions. It'll kind of just be like a big, a big bite of onion. So there's a lot of dishes that layer onions like this. As an example that I can think of, if you think about like Cajun food or like gumbo or jumbo or whatever, a lot of times they will like have cooking onions that they cook way, way down into the roux, but then they'll add onion pieces at the end so you get like different kinds of texture. I don't know if that's informative or not. Oh, I know it's in, I know it's informative. I don't know if that's interesting to anybody. All right, we got our uh, beets. Next up is the veg. We got the tomato. No, we don't. We got the onions and carrots. Yeah. And depending on how much grease you got in the pot, you might have to add a little bit more butter or something. But they also want to salt and pepper them. This is one of those one of those dishes where you just salt and you pepper and you salt and you pepper at like every stage of the game. And that's how you cook. So five the salt. And remember we're doing this because each piece of this stew can be cooked in a nice way before it becomes a stew. So let's think about that. We're gonna do these like 10 minutes or so from a good stir. Got lots of fond on the bottom of the pot. Fond is like the those black bits, nice and flavory. And we're gonna ignite some cognac on them in a little bit to hopefully release that. You could use this Next round of time to chop mushrooms. Continue to, you know, casually drink, take it easy. It's just a weeknight after all, and you know, you're, you're you, so it, it's a weeknight, and maybe you won't take it easy after all. I'll have you know that this is, me drinking from the bottle is completely contrived, and was at the suggestion slash direction of our film editor, John. But I didn't say no. I got my uh, backup glass here, it's a little box wide. Just fine, the only kind, the right kind. I got two two things of mushrooms here, there's a baby bella. Two things equals one pound. That's how the American measurement system works. And you got, you got several options, I would say, in terms of slicing these. But I'm gonna go with quarter. And that's specifically because I think it will expose enough surface area for when we saute these in butter for them to get really nice and a little bit crisp on the outside. But also it will be a fairly hefty piece in our, our stew with the big mouth feel, which I, I, I really, I think that's just about the worst thing you could call it, but it's a chunky stew. One pound of mushrooms is a, is a, a pretty large amount once you have it all chopped up. If you're not really into mushrooms, I would suggest thinly slicing them because for most people they don't like mushrooms because of the texture. If you thinly slice and then saute in butter, the texture will be transformed into crispy flavor wafers. Flavors. If you got dirt on your mushroom, don't even worry about it. Mushroom dirt is clean, you can eat it. 
Can you imagine how dank communion would be if they just gave you like a glass of wine and some mushroom wafers, so it's like some sauteed mushrooms, and they're like, that's the, the body of Christ, is this dank ass mushroom? That would be, that'd be nice. I gotta give those, those vegetables a stir. Oh man, they're cooking up nice. Looking good. I gotta mince some garlic too. Need a couple cloves of garlic here. We'll use fresh today because we're going the, the difficult path. I don't need all these. It's two cloves. It's plenty. So, uh, uh, this previous Sunday, my wife, my, my sweet Courtney, wanted to go to the garden center slash nursery. We go to a local one. You know, it's been there a long time. It's not in a good part of town, but like, you know, when it first was built, it was in a good part of town, but now it's not. We went there, she wanted to get some um, potting soil. We we're working on seedlings for the garden this year. And we went there, and it turns out that the, uh, the nursery was having a special event that was bird themed. And uh, I don't know if like just because the weather was shitty or it's just that time of year, it really wasn't very many people there, but for some reason everywhere we went in that store, people would uh, approach us, kind of like out of nowhere. Like you'd just be like looking at soil and someone, so an old man, old man came up and it looks like this. And this guy's got real big like this. And he said, you guys feed the birds? And like we were like, you know, like it, it, it was like one of those situations where like in the moment you like, like clearly the answer is no, but you don't say no for whatever reason. You go, uh, not presently. And my wife said, not at this time, because we didn't want to shut down the old man. He's clearly like, he likes birds. And actually, every human being in that particular nursery really liked birds. There were birds in the nursery too. They brought them in. But uh, that guy gave us this big ass bag of bird seed which uh, just happens to be hot chili flavored. Squirrels don't like that. So uh, I guess I guess we're gonna feed the birds now. But we got, uh, I, I was carrying around that, that seed sample bag and uh, we, got to the, we got to the checkout. My wife bought a little banana plant and uh, the cashier saw the bird seed sample in my hand and she said, oh, uh, you guys feed the birds? <laughs> I was like, I guess, I guess we do now. It almost felt like I was like encroaching on like some kind of like weird bird feeding cult where like, or maybe it was code for something, I don't really know. So now I'm just thinking like trying to bring that up in like casual conversation to in everyday life like, hey, uh, any of you guys feed the birds? And you know, like true to form as we were like leaving the parking lot, I literally like heard cries of, you guys feed the birds like from the car. <laughs> So I kind of just want to like start incorporating that into the everyday life. I mean, it's, I, I think it's like epitomizes the, the mundaneness of like Midwestern life where people are like, yeah, uh, one of my hobbies is feeding birds, but I don't like feeding squirrels. I got to make sure those squirrels don't get this pile of seeds that have not been deemed suitable for human consumption. I got to put a little chili oil on there. It's not the squirrels. I feed the birds. So that's... That's that. These are looking nice. Smelling amazing. I think I'm gonna add the garlic now. Fresh chopped. We're almost getting to the point where we don't have to work anymore. We can just let this thing cook. I'm gonna set something on fire pretty soon. It's gonna be exciting. I feel like that uh, that enchiladas episode where I had like the pan and I screamed and there was fire. That was that was exciting. Okay, we're gonna do the cognac trick. First step is to turn the heat all the way up where nothing can stop you. When it just sounds like things are heating up in there, that's when it'll be ready. All right, I got my half cup of cognac. The other half cup's inside of me. Okay, so, cognac first. And I'm gonna light this stick, because I don't have a safe way of igniting it otherwise. Well, that's pretty wimpy, but it should be enough to do the job. Nope. Okay, and then you put the fire. Oh, okay, here we go. Well, that, that was lame as shit. It burned a little bit. Whatever. The ignition should have helped remove some of this fun that's building up over here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a bottle of wine to help continue to do that. This is Coates Durrani. That's not how you say it. It's a very tasty wine. Put it a little bit in and you can scrape 
scraping around, and that'll start getting some of that stuff off the bottom. It'll be real nice. Eventually, we're gonna add all this one. I'm sad that ignition didn't work, but I'm also not, not too surprised. All right, we're gonna add our meat back and all that tasty juice. All right, next up, the entire bottle of wine. You want dry wine? Toast to Ron. Ron Johnson. If you would like, you can add beef broth. Or if you got like beef bone, bone broth concentrate, which I happen to have, I'll just give it a, a cursory <laughs> as is tradition. Give them more dank beef flavor. I think it needs just a little bit more liquid. Uh, about a cup of water. That's the other part of the beef broth that I just made. All right, and next we need tomato paste. Now you don't want too much because you don't want this to be like a tomato-y stew, but you do want a little bit because tomatoes add a depth of flavor that is very nice. And in fact, as I just did, you can use the, the lid, just get a little scoop like that. That's all you need. And what are you gonna do with the rest of the tomato paste? Well, yeah, probably shove it up your butt. So next up is some fresh thyme. You could also go with a bouquet, a bouquet garni, which is typically herbs such as, well, it's almost always thyme. Sometimes bay leaves and parsley. Sometimes you got rosemary. Sometimes you got sage. But really, the crucial ingredient is thyme. And if you want to add other things, that's fine, but I really don't think it's gonna make too much of a difference in flavor. You can see I'm just trying to strip some of the leaves. Plop those in there. You need to mix in that tomato paste a little bit. God damn, this is gonna be so good. Okay, this boy, once it's simmering, it's gotta go in that oven. Don't need to do anything else for now. Oh, oh. Thank the Lord for hot grabbies. All right, we'll be back in about an hour or so. Probably a little, uh, a little more wine by then. Been a little bit more than an hour. Yeah, some more clarified for the... Let's heat it up. Let's check on the pot. Bet it's gonna look good. Pretty safe bet. Oh, so this forward has gonna look good. Oh, mama. God damn. Tender beef. Gotta cook this stew gently. And if you see time like that, you can pick it up. Beef could go a little longer. It's not quite falling apart or anything, but that's okay. So we'll let this keep cooking. We're gonna go ahead and put the onions in though. The pearl onions. One bag, which I think is 12 ounces. And you may be tempted in the sake of whatever, to use fresh ones in which you peel them. And I will tell you now, don't do it. It's not worth your life. It's not worth anyone's life to peel pearl onions. I've done it before. I, it's the one, I regret it. Top 10 regrets, peeling pearl onions. It's just not worth it. Leave it to the machines. Submit to automation. Code your onions to peel themselves. All right, meanwhile, get this butter in this pan and we're gonna cook these mushrooms. We're gonna give them a little saute. Well, I'm using a big pan because I think this would be very effective. A little salt in them, them mushrooms. I feel like they just ate that, that butter right up. It's like no butter would. I am gonna hit that with some olive oil. In the meantime, I'm gonna slice some bread. The store said this was a French batard. You could heat this up if you want, or you could not. Do whatever you want with it. It's bread. You wanna get some, some color on these mushrooms. You know what I mean? Get golden. Getting a nice, nice like, uh, golden cook on your mushroom before you put it in the stew. Give it, again, that nice flavor. You're just not gonna get that same flavor from throwing mushrooms right in raw. Oh yeah, man. Be back in a couple, I'll show you what they look like when they're ready. All right, shrooms about ready. They should be like kind of brown. You know, like they've released some liquid. They're starting to stick to the pan. So we will pull our stew back out. Ooh, ooh, pull our shit. Open that bad boy up, and we will get this burner back on and incorporate the mushrooms into the stew. And in Delaware, and in uh, France, Delaware, France. Yeah. Give it a big old mix. We in that home stretch. That beautiful, oh my Christ, you French bastards. All right, we're gonna bring that to a simmer. Couple more minutes, home stretch, baby. God damn. All right, we're there, we did it, it's done. I know because I called it. If you wanna be fancy, you can serve this stew on a piece of bread, which you could toast, but I didn't. And you just take that stew and just plop it over the top. If you got, oh shit. If you got like deep plates such as I have here, it'll look pretty nice, assuming you do this better than I did. Before I taste this, I just want to share a very brief memory that one time, like years ago, like in my early college days, I made this dish 
for my mom. And I used a different Dutch oven. Oh no, I think I used that Dutch oven that she bought for me. And she couldn't believe that I made the dish because it was so good. Love you, mom. All right, it looks like a stew. We got some soggy bread. That's how they like it in England. So I have learned. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, delicious. Man, you just can't beat it. It's extremely buttery, bacony, beefy. You can clearly taste the wine, rich flavor. But it just tastes like the best. I really feel like this is one of those dishes that you can get so good at that you can blow people's minds when you make it for them, but you don't have to be talented to do it. So if you're in the market for a significant other, maybe get good at making this and they'll be like, well, wow. Or, if you're in the market for a mom, maybe get go to making this. My mom liked it, kept me around, but that's how you do it. Well, see you later. Bye-bye.